Good evening, friends. It is now the 28th of November, 1217 a.m., our normal time. And that time stamp is important for one primary reason. I'm going to read you an excerpt from basically a review in regard to maternal COVID-19 vaccination, its potential impact on fetal and neonatal development. The date's important because I want to make sure you recognize that it's recent. And this is the 18th of November, 2021, when it was published. And today is the 28th of November, 2021. Now, most likely, you probably never heard any of this in any of the media outlets, pro or con, and reference to vaccinations. So let us present the data, at least an excerpt from the data for you tonight. Let us begin. All right. To start, a widely cited preliminary study of the V-Safe and Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System Data suggested that COVID-19 mRNA vaccines were safe for pregnant women. Here we go. However, errors were found in their analysis. And a follow-up reanalysis of the data revealed a cumulative incidence of spontaneous abortion seven to eight times higher than the author's original calculations. Seven to eight times higher which was statistically higher than the typical average for pregnancy loss during the equivalent time period, which we're referring to normally as background rates. While this post hoc data analysis of extreme outcomes will be very important for assessing vaccine safety during pregnancy, it does not include more subtle organ development adult changes that would be expected to occur in the fetuses during an AVR and this could lead to an increased risk of disease according to development origins of health and disease. The hypothesis, we've all heard before, we have been advised to feel positive about feeling bad after receiving a COVID-19 vaccine. However, the desired goal of these vaccines is to drive an antiviral cell-mediated immune response against SARS-CoV-2, the pro-inflammatory cytokines, tumor necrosis factor, interleukin, type 1 and 2 interferons can also lead to adverse fetal outcomes. We're going to come back to this article a little bit later on. It has an incredible number of questions it brings up and also references to basically vaccine or inoculation design. And I'll have the links for it, of course, in the YouTube channel as well. But... Also, too, what we like to do here is observe. And our observational uh, tendencies tend to be more on a global scale, and it does involve a little bit of selection bias. So, again, everything has to be validated, uh, peer of use per se, but still, these inadequacies in data collection and orientation in reference to also inspection uh, have now are just, are just befuddling. All right, let us begin. Let's also, too, not... Also, another excerpt. Here we go. Let's look at our data analysis in reference to Singapore. How many of you heard about what's been going on in Singapore? Ready for what I call the Singapore anomaly? All right, let's look right here. Singapore, right here, is literally your most vaccinated country per hundred out of any place else in the world. 91.91 individuals per 100 vaccinated. What happened? You ready? Let us look. People fully vaccinated per 100, new deaths smooth per million. The purple line is people fully vaccinated per 100. This was the deaths per million. Look at this. All of a sudden, right about this time, it's September 20th, the death rates per million began to skyrocket. At the same time, too, correlating pretty heavily with look how fast they started vaccinating individuals. So you're looking between here, July and October. Now, you normally would think with rapid or mass vaccination, especially fully vaccinated, you would not see this happen. But it did. Henceforth, I call it an anomaly. So let us look down a little further. Positivity rate. The positivity rate still continues to increase. Look at the vaccination rate. Again, I call that an anomaly. Let's go down here. 
Now, the cases per million have begun to drop, but what happened? That I would really be curious to know. Anybody from Singapore wants to chime in to explain exactly what happened? Uh, to have that skyrocketing increase just shortly, almost the gap between full vaccination and the increase almost has tends to have a parallel effect until the top there, right when you're about 80 per 100 vaccinated. But again, the objective here is not to speculate outside of anything from an observational standpoint, an observation and correlation. And obviously, I have questions in regard to, or I have doubts, I should say, into how a lot of these studies have been conducted half shot. And last week, we also read some disturbing articles that were printed in British Medical Journal in regard to research analysis during phase three trials. I expected better. And I'd like to know exactly what's going on, but there it is. And um, I don't want to add conjecture, but why? Why did that occur? Be really curious to find out if anybody has an answer to that. Uh, let us begin with also to the research articles. You know, I like to start off the positive stuff. We'll come back to these questions a little bit later on. But we're going to cover this article a little more in depth, but let's get to some of the positive stuff that actually can help people in the beginning. Not, <laughs> that to, forgive me, not a lot of positive, but some good uh, pilot studies in reference to things that may help in the future. And this one I like a lot too. And again, we'll get back to the other research in regard to some of the questions being brought up last week during Thanksgiving week of all times, a little bit later on. Licorice. And a lot of uh, our observers, for example, especially watch this channel, bring up licorice quite a bit in reference to SARS-CoV-2. And this research article brings up a lot of uh, good points and why it may be a powerful tool. So let us begin. I'm just going to go through the, uh, you know, as you see a lot of things here, uh, all the other treatments that they used. Uh, some of the names there, you know, are quite um, interesting, but there's that. And uh, let's go down the line. And there it is. Interesting as far as it goes through the history and the background of why licorice, uh, Greek work meaning sweet root. And which is kind of interesting because a lot of cultures, maybe because of trade routes or whatever it is, uh, tend to adapt that sweet, whoops, there, make that go away. Sweet grass, sweet root, come on. And there it is. And it's been used quite often through multiple cultures. And the hypothesis that the researchers bring up in reference to research in regard to it is basically it's been used as an anti-cancer, hepatoprotective, antispasmodic, neuroprotective, antioxidant. Estrogenic properties are very useful in reducing hepatocellular damage and chronic hepatitis, B, C, and so on and so forth. So it has a great history in reference to the pharmacopoeia of licorice, also remember a lot of people, they chew DGL licorice uh, for ulcers and things along those lines. And so it gives a good aspect, but it's gonna focus primarily on a couple different aspects of it to the chemical properties, such as GL and glyceronatinic acid. So we'll look at those right here. There it is, the glycerin and the glycerinic, glycerinic acid right there. So when you see GA, you're referring to glycerinic acid, and we see GL, you're referring to glycerin. All right, I'm trying to say that this midnight. So again, my pronunciation's sometimes not the most eloquent. So there we are, GA and GL. So those are your bioactive compounds as we go through the rest of the research article itself. So let us proceed. Blah, blah, blah. Great, great history in reference to it. But why the hypothesis in regard to SARS-CoV-2? Right here. They're looking at basically all the properties of uh, basically licorice in regard to reduction of inflammation, the immune system, so on and so forth. And then it goes down to here. Autophagy is a cellular mechanism that cells use to adapt to stress conditions, including the internal invasion of pathogens. The process helps clear out the pathogens. Thereby, remember we looked at curcetin before and returned to autophagy. Uh, and so you, you have this nice little licorice curcetin thing, if those that follow the channel thereby reducing pathogen replication and subsequent inflammatory consequences. However, some viruses like SARS-CoV-2 and HSV-1 can inhibit autophagy mechanisms to suit their replication conditions. So that's where they're bringing in basically the hypothesis reference to licorice. It is well established that among other actions, SARS-CoV-2 infection becomes serious because of lung inflammation 
in multi-organ failure. It is currently hypothesized that many lives could be saved if we could reduce the inflammation among the seriously ill COVID-19 patients. The three key properties of licorice is its antiviral action, right there, autophagy uh, enhanced mechanism, which we talked about, which I wasn't even aware of until I read this research article, and its anti-inflammatory ability. Might be able to improve the health status of COVID-19 patients in the following ways. And the following ways are as follows. Ba ba ba. Pretty basic graphic, as you can see. And so, but basically, if it's doesn't have to be complicated, if it works, it works. And that's the beauty about it. And so, let's go down to the end here. A uh, licorice has, and this goes with some a few of the caveats. I'm not going to go into uh, to too much, uh, you know, detail, but they look at the oral dose, uh, what they did with SARS-CoV-1. If you look back here or from a while ago, and they looked at that much they used. And an intravenous dose, which I was quite surprised, uh, was found that adverse reactions can result in overuse of overdose licorice, which we're familiar with. Sodium ion levels and low potassium levels in the body, such conditions lead to water retention, hypertension. So those are your caveats. So you can read all throughout here uh, in reference to that. But then let's go to our conclusion. And again, my main objective is to bring you, the attention to you and you can go through the research on your own. Licorice is cheap and plentiful compared to allopathic medications and can thus make dramatic health improvements in the developing and underdeveloped world. Therefore, it suggests that the researchers should undertake in vitro and in vivo studies with GA and GL against SARS-CoV-2 and based on the success, move forward with clinical trials, which may help mitigate COVID-19 severity. Again, it's an exploratory research article looking at the history of licorice and why it could be of use in reference to the current um, dilemma which we suffer today in regards to SARS-CoV-2. Again, the links will be there for you once uh, the video is fully rendered in 4K. It'll be uh, then a bookmark it for you like I do with the other videos and it'll be easy to get to, even though we're kind of starting with this one right off the bat. So, you know, there it is. But here's another thing. Look at this fungi thing, which is be important as far as being antifungal. Uh, because these elements right here, and this is the next one, the SARS-CoV-2 papain-like protease, PL pro and complex with natural compounds reveal allosteric sites for antiviral drug design. Now, they go into detail on why the SARS-CoV-2 papain-like protease covers multiple functions, because it needs it. And so what ends up happening, it'll go into this wonderful detail and basically what it does and why these three elements show great promise as well. So let us begin. Because that the natural compounds we identified may also reinstate the antiviral immune response process of the host that are downregulated in COVID-19 infections. All right, so it basically because of such. One approach we followed recently is the massive X-ray crystallographic screening for inhibitors of SARS-CoV-2 main protease M-PRO. You hear that a lot. The essential protein in the viral replication process and hence an important drug target. We identified six compounds inhibiting, which we're only going to cover three today, inhibiting Empro that showed antiviral activity, and these compounds are currently approaching the step of preclinical investigations. I like to see them speed it up, but here we go. Now check out the compounds. Ba, 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 ba. Scroll, scroll, scroll. All right, this first one, a sunny alba. You know what that is? Henna, which is actually kind of interesting. There's a great breakdown how it may work as far as a reference to the PL Pro. Again, not going into dosages and things like that. It's just basically to look at the, the exploratory uh, aspects of, which I didn't realize this either. This is, again, I learned so much as I'm reading at the same time as antiarrhythmia, uh, but I never knew that about henna. I mean, we think henna, what's the first thing we think? Hair dye. You know what? I, that's, that's it. But as far as in benefit in reference to this, that's actually really cool. Acalthia, acalithia, acalitha. I um, think it's called mule at the same time too. Uh, it's used in a lot of other medic, uh, folklore medicine and uh, a bit traditional medicine as well. Uh, just never very familiar with it, I guess, on the Western side here. But acalitha, torta, otherwise I think it's also known as M-U-E-L-L. -L. And then also too, another one, marigold. And so, you notice, for example, diphenol is found in green tea with antioxidant and anti-inflammatory effects. Really kind of cool. Whoop, and be back one second. Hang on, hang on, hang on. So you get a good solid idea. 
So let's scroll down, see if there's anything else in regards to that. Also, too, yeah, as we get towards the bottom, you can see its effect in, in vitro, which is kind of cool. But it also goes into how the extraction process is utilized, what parts of the plant are used, uh, and so on and so forth, which is really quite interesting. And again, it's the uh, Califa, Califa Torta, and so on and so forth, uh, the henna. And it just, it's just actually, it's just intriguing. But again, those are three pilot items which should be making some progress over the horizon. It gives you, for example, how they collected the whole lineup. All right, now to the next one. Are you ready? And again, the links will be there once I get the YouTube thing all uh, rendered to 4K. You know, they'll always bookmark it for you. Once again, now this is something to take into account when kids were, for example, not going to school and so, so, so on and so forth in the United States because the, the lack of exposure to common cold. Uh, now they're not saying get sick and so on and so forth, but however, though, they found out that those which have common uh, cold exposure often tend not to be to have as many problems. The researchers were able to demonstrate that people who caught SARS-CoV-2 had lower levels of antibodies against coronaviruses that are caused that cause common colds. So you see right, for example, let's see right here. There's that common colds compared to uninfected people. In addition, people with high levels of antibodies against harmless coronaviruses were less likely to have been hospitalized after catching SARS-CoV-2. Our study shows that a strong antibody response to human coronaviruses increases the levels of antibodies against SARS-CoV-2. So someone who has gained immunity to harmless coronaviruses is therefore also better protected against severe SARS-CoV-2 infections. Now that brings up a lot of interesting aspects in reference to things like a vaccine development uh, or inoculation, or if you're really, 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 really old, variolation. And so kids, when they go to school, what happens? They get tons of colds. And so the school atmosphere in being exposed to relatively harmless uh, coronavirus per se may yield a little bit of benefit there. But again, the links will be there for you to follow as well. But still, that's just uh, reinforcing information that we were uh, suspicious of in the beginning or suspected. And uh, this is like the fourth article now confirming that. So let us proceed forward. And then, ba-boom, uh, we're going to come back to this in a little bit. I don't know why I have it in this section, but we're going to come back to that just a little bit. But here we go. In fact, move this over here. So as soon as we get done, then we'll come back to it. All right. All of these articles are important. Very high relative serum prevalence, meaning people have been exposed to things, of anti-SARS-CoV-2 antibodies among communities in Bangui, Bangui, uh, Central African Republic. Now, the reason this is important, this article is vital, is because, well, let's just, let's just read the part excerpt right off the bat. Here we go. Ba, 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 Here we go. Benge. I think it's called Benge. The Central African Republican at one point, this is the first serological study conducted in general urban population of the Central African Republican, Republican? Uh, at more one than one year after the COVID-19 pandemic started in the country. The prevalence of anti-SARS-CoV-2 antibodies was 74.1% in the population not already vaccinated against COVID-19. All right, so basically they've had exposure to, or somehow they've developed anti-SARS-CoV-2 antibodies in about three quarters of the population not already vaccinated against COVID-19. To our knowledge, is a very high seroprevalence compared to those reported to date in Africa. This result therefore indicates a very high degree of contact of study population with the SARS-CoV-2 in Bengay. Hang on one second, one second. Bengay, not Bengay, Bengay. So please forgive me on that. I just wanted to just check, that's why I paused it for a second, just to check the pronunciation. The main reason for this high seroprevalence is presumably the lack of application and preventative measures by the general population, meaning no pandemic lockdowns. Irrespective of their nature, in particular strict confinement, social distancing, and the wearing of masks, these measures have essentially never been adhered to due to economic and sociological reasons. And again, observation, observation, observation. So let's take a brief 
side trip to look at our world and data, one of our one of our information resources, and see exactly how this Central African Republic or Central Africa Republic, I don't know why I say Republican, obviously someone was a little political there, but there is the actual way, uh, basically uh, how they fared. You ready? You ready? Let's check out, and I'm going to go to our world and data instead of pull up the data on our own because sometimes it's nice to use different data sources from time to time just to give you a, at least an idea how it looks here. So let's begin. Where are we? There is our Central African Republic. You see right down here? Let's see if I can work here. Right there is Bengi. Uh, and there's Singapore right up here. And there is Canada, United Kingdom, Germany, United States, and that's people fully vaccinated. All right, so obviously not a lot of people fully vaccinated in the Central African Republic. But how's the caseload? Let us look. Let's see. And this is going to, we're going to go by population, confirmed cases. So this per million people, so we're comparing apples to apples. And where is it? Can we make this bigger? Let's make this a little bigger so it's easier to see. There we are. And so where are we right here? There we are. The Central African Republic. Uh, lacking in vaccination, lacking in cases per million. Here's Germany, United Kingdom, Singapore, United States, Italy, Canada, and in India. You know, they got a little bit vaccinated, uh, not as heavily vaccinated. Let's review that data once again, because again, everything I go by is really about data. And so if we go data, da, 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 people fully vaccinated, just so you can reiterate, and so you confirm right there, there it is, there's India, and uh, you can see the rates right there. And so, Let's what now, what about mortality? Wow, there we are again. And so I'm no pandemic measures, no mandatory vaccination by far, or hardly any vaccinations whatsoever, masking, distancing, so on and so forth. Um, you know, interesting, you know what I mean? And so there it goes, finally it rides up there. But otherwise, it's in, it's intriguing because again, correlation, uh, observation, something just doesn't seem right in regard to a lot of the pandemic uh, mitigation measures. I mean, they make sense on paper, but I'm looking at real world results and it doesn't, it, no, it's, it's not there. And so I don't know, you know what I mean? But that's, that's Benge. Bengi, Bengi. And so the research article will be there for you to link just as well. Now, let's just take a brief trip down to our states here as well, uh, because let's look at basically what we have here. Uh, so I wanna give you the comparison, for example, of um, Florida and Texas. So let's just go down here real fast. We'll go back up to the top, so we'll cover all the data as well. But now is more of an appropriate time to check out that data. And the interesting thing is too, now they have the Omicron. It's it's like I'm dealing with a bunch. Of, it's like we're dealing with a bunch of children. Uh, Omicron. Uh, if you look at the, for example, the outcome in Africa in reference to caseloads and mortality, and then you know they they're cutting off travel and things like that. Um, well, again, uh, speculation is, it could be a done with a very wide brush. And who's to say if they're wrong? But, you know, probability and possibility. So here we are. Now let's look at Florida. Let's see how they did with Florida. Deaths per 100,000, Florida. Let's just look at one week. Let's make this a little smaller. So it all fits in there. Perfect. And there, there's a week. Uh, so Florida now is basically really low on the mortality uh, I don't know why it's going that way because it's so small. Uh, compared to, look, the, it's like, all right, that's almost like a negative. Let's look, but you know what I mean? Florida mortality per 100,000 is pretty low. California, much higher. 
New York, much higher. Now, remember when we predicted, I told you Texas would drop, but we followed the exact same pattern. Texas, which is also anti-mandate lockdowns and so on and so forth. Again, it's observation. I'm just for, I'm waiting for observational data to support any of the um, pandemic mitigation lockdown measures that have been in, in, I mean, incorporated in many of the states. How about cases? Let's look at cases. You already can see where that goes, just looking at the data. All right, then again, we'll come back to this in a little bit too. So let's just, uh, let's just do it this way. All right, what do we have? Case rate, that's per 100,000, 31 per 100,000. California, 70 per 100,000. New York, 194 per 100,000. And in Texas, 59. I, once again, uh, observation, observation, observation. I cannot find a rationale. Um, in the beginning, I could because maybe it worked, maybe it didn't. But right now, I'm thinking more dysbiosis. And uh, uh, because they've been not in a natural uh, operating environment for so long that it can create alterations around things like microbiomes, especially if you're wearing something over your mouth and nose because we declared war kind of on you know the breathing passages of the face. You know, like somehow there's some sort of evolutionary mistake. Um, that we should have just sealed off our nose and mouth a long time ago. Mm, yeah. All right. Here we go. Next one. Ba -ba -bam. All right. So that's it. Bengi. Bengi. All right. Now we go to, I'm going to close out our world and data. Actually, move it over here so we can give them credit a little, little bit later on. All right. This is a really good article from the Daily Mail. And the reason this one's important, system's running a little slow. The reason it's real important is because we don't, uh, we're not the lucky recipients of a lot of the international news. And Great Britain, for example, they're not vaccinating their kids. And this is the reason why. And they put it really well in a basic article. And unvaccinated children had just a 3% higher chance of catching COVID compared to double jab Pfizer US trial and none was seriously ill. How many of you heard about the study in the United States? Seriously. I mean, that's what it is. Let's go down. Let's why. What was the rationale? What was their argument? All right. Well, this, this picture comes up in a second. There it is. Here it is. This explains it quite well. Fears of a rare, uh, heart, a very rare heart condition side effect called myocarditis. This is the reason why. But let's just show you the chart. Here it goes. Healthy kids. Risk of being admitted to ICU with COVID, uh, COVID. Two per million. Kids with health issues, 100 per million. So give it an idea. First dose, risk of myocarditis, three to 17 per million. So you're gonna vaccinate, for example, now, the chronic health issues we'll keep aside for a second. Let's just take the healthy kids. And all kids, regardless of, you know, it's not to demean any, you know, child uh, as far as the concern. So every child needs to be protected, all right? Keep that in mind. So it's not to bemoan that or dismiss that. But however, though, with healthy kids, is it fair? Healthy kids, two per million of coming down with COVID and going to the ICU. Three to 17 per million of myocarditis. And then on the second dose, 12 to 13 per million. Is that really fair? Is that really fair? I mean, seriously? And that is why it says that number 10's vaccine advisors, the Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunization, to opt against routinely jabbing healthy 12 to 15 year olds who face a tiny risk of getting seriously ill from the virus. It said the risk of healthy children being admitted to ICU from COVID was two in a million, rising to 100 per million in those with underlying health conditions. Meanwhile, there'd be a three to 17 cases of myocarditis for every first dose dished out and 12 to 34 cases following each second dose. The rest of the world is not fall, falling in our, our following. I should say falling is probably the more appropriate word, following in our footsteps because they're getting more data oriented and they are basically following, you know, the science from the way they see it. And they're balancing our risk to benefit ratios and what the heck are we doing here in the United States? All right, next after that. But, but, but I'm gonna close this one out because this one takes a lot of background memory. All right, here we are. 
Now I want to go to this one. I'll start reading the excerpts. I'm going to be real reluctant to uh, basically speculate beyond what I'm reading uh, because it's more important for me to get the information to you. It's supposed to be risked being censored, which is a whole another atrocity of this uh, whole pandemic mitigation. Mitigation means more than just basically mitigating against the disease, obviously. Again, they said it was disease and misinformation. Uh, but let's let's read some actual information here for you. Most COVID-19 vaccine reactions include injection site arrhythmia, pain, swelling, fatigue, um, fever, and lymphadenopathy, which may be sufficient to affect fetal neonatal development. In this review, we have explored components of the first generation viral vector and MNRA COVID vaccines that are believed to contribute to adverse reactions which may negatively impact fetal and neonatal development. And out of respect for the researchers, which you have to give these researchers an incredible amount of credit, uh, seriously, when everyone's basically just doing uh, virtue research into the publish or die a mantra, there are some researchers where you're actually asking the tough questions. And they're asking tough questions, which in reality is no benefit to them, but benefit to all of us. So let's begin. All right. There is a concerted global effort to underway to encourage pregnant women to get vaccinated despite, despite the lack of safety data for this demographic. The rationale being that pregnant women who get COVID-19 are more likely to get critically ill and have adverse fetal and neonatal outcomes. However, this rationale is not supported by how many studies? All studies. A wildly excited preliminary study of the V-SAFE, this is disturbing to me, uh, and vaccine adverse reporting system data suggested that COVID-19 mRNA vaccines were safe for pregnant women. However, errors were found in the analysis. In a follow-up reanalysis, the data revealed a cumulative incidence of spontaneous abortion seven to eight times higher than the original author's calculation, which was statistically higher than the typical average for pregnancy loss during this equivalent time period. While this post hoc data analysis of extreme outcomes would be important for assessing vaccine safety during pregnancy, it does not include more subtle multi-organ developmental changes that would be expected to occur in the fetus during an AVR, and this, these could lead to an increased risk of disease according to the developmental origins of health and disease, the DOHA hypothesis. We have been advised to feel positive about feeling bad after receiving a COVID-19 vaccine. However, the desired goal of these vaccines is to drive an antiviral cell mediated immune response, obviously I'm reiterating from the beginning, against SARS-CoV-2, can also lead to adverse fetal outcomes. Oh, hang on one sec. All right, now this is where it gets really interesting. I mean, really interesting. Again, I want to caveat this. This is basically information that requires follow-up, but they're solid questions. And the links will be there, obviously, once it renders to 4K, I'll have a bookmark for you so you can go straight to it. But here we go. They also contain a novel lipid nanoparticle, and LNP, carrier system that allows for efficient endocytosis of the mRNA cargo by host cells. These LNPs possess adjuvant-like properties, both inflammatory and mRNA stabilizing, which is why conventional adjuvants, adjuvants, are now required for these vaccines. Interesting, because it's the LNP. So like, for example, like, you know, certain things to weaken viruses and so on and so forth, but proceed, are now required for these vaccines. Nevertheless, the RNAs are not very stable when stored below negative 80 degrees centigrade and rapidly degrade at body temperature. The LPNs, here we go, are comprised of ionizable cationic lipid phospholipids, cholesterol, and polyethylene glycols, which are used to control the LMP size. Prolong circulation time and prevent LMP aggregation during vaccine storage. Concerns were raised years ago regarding the safety of LMPs due to their biodistribution. For example, they were found to disperse to the ovaries in experimental mice. Pfizer's own pharmacokinetic studies of surrogate vaccine containing ALC0315 and ALC0159 LMPs, that's these right here, the lipid carrier systems, demonstrated that they dispersed over a 48 hour period of time to many 
of the rat, endocrine, and immune organs, including the ovaries, adrenals, bone marrow, liver, and covered up there, spleen. Let's proceed forward. Lots of information in reference to this article, and it is like a train wreck of potential out negative outcomes. But to proceed, the mRNA vaccines are designed to allow a host cell to express a spike protein in its cell membrane and expression of the spike protein throughout the body is dependent on the biodistribution of the LMPs, which primarily relocate to the spleen and liver, but it has also been found in various other tissues. We currently have no idea how long spike proteins are expressed by different host cells, get a little closer there, and what tissue spike protein expression can occur because the biodistribution studies on the spike protein have not been carried out to date. Isn't that comforting? All right. A recent study suggested that the biodistribution of the mRNA to milk during lactation is not a concern as none was detected in milk from the six mothers, six mothers, four to 48 hours post Pfizer BioNTech and Moderna vaccination. However, a study demonstrated that following COVID-19 mRNA vaccination, exosomes expressed in spike protein could be detected in plasma up to four months post-vaccination. Really? Which is concerning because we and others have shown that exosomes can be shed in bodily fluids such as colostrum and milk. Lastly, they have provided evidence that SARS-CoV-2 sequences can become integrated in human genetic DNA. Speculated that retrotransposins, remember we talked about that in one of the first questions in reference to uh, vaccinations when they were working on vaccines uh, targeted to RBD, receptor binding domain, as opposed to spike protein. And they were trying to figure out, well, they were, I think it was, was it Rutgers University with New York, one of the uh, universities in the East Coast who was developing the RBD vaccine. And this was like months and months and months ago. And they mentioned this. And now it was not in a positive light. But to proceed, the retrotransposins in sperm and embryos could theoretically copy and paste SARS-CoV-2 DNA into the fetal genome, resulting in the expression of spike protein that could render the needle, neonatal immune system defenseless to mount an immune response to subsequent SARS-CoV-2 infection to immune tolerance to viral proteins. Now, I apologize about the highlight there going up like that. But however, though, let's do it this way. Now, this is going to play a role in the other research articles we're going to look at in a second because they're going to refer to something similar to this called imprinting. Now, if this is true, that could render the neonatal, natal, uh, neonatal immune system defenseless to mount an immune response, and they're mandating vaccines. And this, these questions have not been addressed fully. Well, you know where I'm going with this. To proceed forward. And again, I don't want to take up too much time, but this is a pretty uh, profound uh, review. Very recently, pay attention to this as well. Uh, idiotypic antibodies, idio, idio, uh, were also proposed as an autoimmune response following SARS-CoV-2 infection. In this study, they detected ACE2 autoantibodies in convalescent people that recovered plasma from previously infected patients, which are also correlated with anti-spike protein RBD antibody levels. Since patients with ACE2 autoantibodies had less plasma, they did not go forward. They hypothesized that the ACE2 autoantibodies were anti-idiotypic antibodies that could interfere with ACE2 function and contribute to post-acute sequelae of SARS-CoV-2 infection. Long COVID. All right, now this is going to be interesting. Start drawing connection between the words and pay attention to this because this is going to come up in another article too, just in a few seconds. We are unaware of ACE2 autoantibody levels being assessed following COVID-19 vaccination, so this warrants further investigation. So be it. Collectively, the above autoimmune response is triggered by infection with SARS-CoV-2 or the COVID-19 vaccines suggest potential negative outcomes on fetal and neonatal development, and this will be explored in future studies. 
As with APS, cytokine storms and thromboinflammation are of concern, as in the potential for autoantibody responses that could target fetal neonatal proteins. This is a huge article. In closing, we currently have no data to assess the outcome of paternal COVID-19 vaccination on offspring health. And this may take years to generate. We believe that ovine model can be used to rapidly assess potential concerns about the administration of COVID-19 vaccines during pregnancy. And that the knowledge gained will help us to predict potential health outcomes in human offspring which could lead to the development of treatments to help mitigate any potential adverse outcomes. What the frickin' heck when you read that comment there, which can help us lead to development of treatments to help mitigate any potential adverse outcomes. When you think of risk to benefit ratio and so on and so forth, keep that in mind. Again, uh, I don't know what to say about mandating something which is basically has so many more questions uh, attached to it than actually answers interesting too ovine ovine has a little short story to it i want to go back i want to take a little bit of a of a, a trivia type thing you know why they call uh you know sars cov 2 covid 19 to begin with and this is part of this was the first major error i saw from, uh, from the world health organization they caused, started bringing everything else into question. But just a little trivia side note, because you see ovine. Ovine is basically working for sheep, all right? So basically what they're attempting to do is saying, hey, we can use ovine models to study long-term uh, outcomes of maternal COVID-19 vaccination, and we should be doing it now. That's what the researchers is attempting to imply. Start your research now. Don't wait till the negative outcomes later on, especially since you're mandating it. He's not even trying to say don't mandate it. He's just saying you guys are doing what you're going to do. And henceforth, this is what we should be doing in the future to help mitigate any damage done uh, from potential negative outcomes. But when they called it COVID, the reason they called it COVID, and you'll get a kick out of this, and this is from the World Health Organization. They said, for a risk communication perspective, using the name SARS can have unattended consequences in terms of creating unnecessary fear for some populations, especially in Asia, which was worse affected by SARS outbreak in 2003. All right. So you see it as such. So you get the idea. Uh, and of course, obviously, too, and I want to close this out in a second as well. Uh, they were they're afraid of scaring people is what they said. That's why they decided to call it COVID-19 as opposed to SARS. And that exactly did not really work out well for them, did it? And obviously, if you're familiar with, uh, I know uh, Reuters tried to make an article discounting it, but check out what Ovid means in the traditional Latin. It's derived from the word ovis because the sheep. And obviously, Latin may imply that something about Ovid, and you see some debate in regard to this, uh, is actually was a uh, a delineation of sheep so the the rumor began covid see sheep and yeah not not the best in reference to public relations ever and so think of it that way all right now let me close this out real fast next article we proceed da, da, da. and the links will be there for you to follow as well here we go antibodies mimicking the virus may explain long haul covid where did we just see that long haul COVID just a few seconds ago? Uh, anti idiotypic, is it idiotypic or idiotypic? And long COVID. And then following one week later, here we are. Now, out of respect for the researchers, I'm only going to highlight a few sections and I'm not going to add any publisher bias or any further conjecture because these are real touchy areas and uh, I want to keep the, uh, the review as clean as possible. So just by reading the, the title itself should give you adequate information uh, in regard to questions. Antibodies mimicking the virus may explain long haul COVID-19 rare vaccine side effects. The hypothesis details the means for the immune system to regulate autoantibodies. Uh, sorry, not autoantibodies. It describes a cascade in which the immune system initially launches protective antibody responses to an antigen-like virus. The same protective antibodies later can trigger a new antibody response toward themselves. 
leading to the disappearance over time. And now a lot of people are aware of the waning antibodies in regard to vaccinations. And again, just to highlight an observation. These secondary antibodies called anti-idiotype uh, antibodies uh, can bind and deplete. Let me hang on one second. I want to make sure I get that pronunciation correct. I just had a service to you. Hang on. Yeah, it's idiotype. Just wanted to validate that. Antibodies can bind and deplete the initial protective antibody responses. They have the potential to mirror or act like the original antigen itself. This may result in adverse effects. A fascinating aspect of the newly formed anti-idiotype antibodies is that some of their structures can be a mirror image of the original antigen and act like it in the binding to do the same receptors that the viral antigen binds. This binding could potentially lead to unwanted actions in pathology, particularly in the long term. As for COVID-19 vaccines, the primary antigen used is the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. Current research studies on antibody responses to these vaccines may mainly focus on the initial protective responses and virus neutralizing efficacy rather than the long-term aspects. This needs to follow what it takes to keep the protective responses going as well as the potential unwanted side effects of both the infection and the different SARS-CoV-2 vaccine types, especially as boosting is now implied. So basically, this will be there for you to follow. And this article, I have to give them credit, was actually printed in the New England Journal of Medicine, which I was surprised because it's been like rah, rah, rah. Then all of a sudden, we didn't hear anything from the New England Journal of Medicine for a few weeks. And then this was the first article they responded by. This is the actual full uh, article, uh, Clinical Implications of Basic Research, a Possible Role for the Anti-Idiotype Antibodies in SARS-CoV-2 Infections and Vaccinations. The development of multiple efficacious vaccines has been critical in the control of the pandemic, but their efficacy has been limited by the appearance of viral variants and the vaccines can be associated with rare off-target or toxic effects, including allergic reactions, myocarditis, and immune-mediated thrombosis and thrombocytopenia in some of the healthy adults. Many of these phenomena are likely to be immune-mediated. How can we understand the diversity in the immune responses in different persons? However, as a result of this mimicry, AB2 antibodies have had the potential to bind to the same receptor that the original antigen was targeting. So again, we're referring to long COVID. AB2 antibodies bind to the original receptor on the normal cells, therefore have the potential to mediate profound effects, because we could be afraid of fast, on the cell that could result in pathological changes, particularly in the long term, long after the original antigen itself has disappeared. The article will be there. Again, I don't want to add more to it than they already explored. Antibodies mimicking the virus may explain long-haul COVID-19 rare vaccine side effects. Next, reinfection with SARS-CoV-2 outcome risk factors and vaccine efficacy in Scottish court. Again, there's a little bit of selection bias. There's a lot of articles out there which speak positively of inoculation, but these are beginning to become more and more pro uh, pronounced and it just happened to be during Thanksgiving week that a lot of these articles uh, questioning some aspects and dimensions of inoculation strategies had begin to arise to proceed. This is going to come down to imprinting. And imprinting, and they're going to make a reference to another article that was a few months ago, which we'll cover in a second, on why they were worried about imprinting. So let's take a scenario. Let's say, for example, let's say the vaccines that we have currently did not wane. They work perfectly still against the original variant. But through imprinting over and over and over again, it creates a conundrum. And I don't want to implant, again, you have to read between the lines on that to proceed. The rate of detected reinfection after two doses of vaccine was 1.35 on average, times higher in those vaccinated before first infection than those unvaccinated first infection. So what ends up happening, happening is the individual was vaccinated twice and then they got sick through a breakthrough case and then they got reinfected again. The individual that was not vaccinated and actually caught whatever, SARS or COVID, then it gets vaccinated afterwards. The immune response is superior to the individual that was vaccinated and then reinfected is what they're implying. The rate of detected reinfection after two doses of vaccine was 1.35 on average, times higher in those vaccinated 
before first infection and those unvaccinated at first infection. All right, and that's pretty much the study and we go down to the bottom here and this is where it's gonna allude to something else. The combination of natural infection, uh, the combination of natural infection and two doses of vaccine provides maximal protection against new COVID-19 or new infection with COVID-19. In this group, the level of protection is only slightly less in those who are vaccinated at first infection than in those who are unvaccinated at first infection, which we covered. All right, and then we go down to the bottom here. And here we go. The results support other estimates that protection against infection and hospitalized COVID-19 conferred prior infection the similar magnitude to those obtained with vaccination. The level of protection conferred by the combination of vaccination and natural infection is slightly less when vaccination precedes the first infection. This is relevant to concerns that vaccination, here we go, might narrow subsequent immune responses to antigenic imprinting arising from a recent report that N antibody levels at the first infection are lower in those that have received two doses of vaccination before infection. All right, now they're referring to the footnote here and that's where I'm gonna to go to right now. You ready? This was a concern brought up a while ago. We hypothesize, just to show you where I'm at, we hypothesize that this may be sub, because reformulating severe acute Respiratory syndrome coronavirus vaccines with variant strains is being pursued to combat, remember Omicron? No, that one. Pursued to combat the global surge infections. We hypothesize that this may be suboptimal due to immune imprinting from earlier vaccination or infection with the original SARS-CoV-2 strain. New strategies may be needed to improve efficacy of SARS-CoV-2 variant vaccines like receptor binding domain as opposed to the spike protein. Goes to a great study here. The problem with the variants, and we go down. Immune imprinting is a phenomenon where initial response to one virus strain effectively primes B cell memory and limits development, I get that there? Limits development of memory B cells and neutralizing antibodies against new minor variant strains of the virus. I'll reiterate, immune imprinting is a phenomenon where initial exposure to one virus strain effectively primes B cell memory and limits, limits the development of memory B cells and neutralize the antibodies against new uh, minor variant strains of the virus. Although it is hoped that immune imprinting will not be a major problem for SARS-CoV-2 infections, the possibility that immune imprinting will substantially reduce efficacy of future SARS-CoV-2 vaccines requires action now to both define the extent of the problem and begin and devise to devise solutions. All right. So to proceed, it goes a great article on what's happening potentially. And then as we go down, the risks. Reduced effectiveness and observed against neutralization escape strains relative to ancestral strains for all SARS-CoV-2 vaccines studied to date. And there you have another footnote, suggesting that non-neutralizing responses might only elicit modest protective value against such new strains. As the world grapples with control of SARS-CoV-2 in the coming years, it seems like the recurrent vaccination or infections will become common Immune imprinting may become an increasingly important issue to consider. This suggests that pre-existing cross-reactive antibodies to spike can limit new antibody responses to spike protein we talked about from different viral strains. This is consistent with the potential problem of immune imprinting between ancestral and variant strains of SARS-CoV-2. Concluding remark. Here we go. We hypothesize that updated vaccines against SARS-CoV-2 variants might primarily boost imprinted immune responses to conserved regions of the spike protein to the detriment of new neutralizing responses to antigenically altered sites with new variants, within new variants. We argue that this updated strain vaccine strategy can still yield partial efficacy against new variants, particularly for vaccines that induce potent neutralizing responses. However, 
Robust long-term control of COVID-19 may require the development of strategies that avoid primarily boosting imprinted immune responses and instead focus on neutralizing antibody immunity over the novel RBD epitopes evolving in the emergence of variants and concerns. Again, receptor binding domain. Uh, it's been brought up quite a bit. Not the spike proteins, but man, we're going for broke on, just neut uh, on the same inoculations over and over again with the same thing with a lot of other immunologists and researchers are saying, hey, uh, you know, change your focus. That's what they're trying to imply. All right, and that is it for our research articles. Again, a little detailed, a little scientific, but again, raised a lot of questions. And now we are going to go into ba -ba -bom, our basically our data and be using European uh, database, the Dura Vigilance, the GIS aid, obviously, which if it ever comes up there, there it is, and our world and data, which we showed you before, um, you know, Omicron or whatever it is. Let's just look at this real fast. Africa, all right? Because, you know, you see the news and everything else. There's Africa. So it's not like the Central African Republican is actually any better than any place else. And this is confirmed mortality. And Omicron is coming from Africa. We're, we're banning travel. You know, that really worked well for Delta and everything else like that. But still, I guess you feel like you need, you're doing something of use and your bureaucrat. You know, I, I just, I, I honestly don't feel they have the scientific uh, depth in order to um, have done the right thing or sometimes not have to do things which you know are going to commit harm in exchange for uncertainties but there it is that's africa africa omicron and you know if anything africa should be banning travel from the united kingdom united states and germany you know what i mean that's just it just then I'm, I'm sure there's a great explanation for why they're doing what they're doing all right so let's begin uh, the data analysis as follows i'm a little bitter tonight you can tell because after reading some of the studies i'm sorry it's just, I mean, I'm waiting for something to be, a, you know, of use, and there can be confirmation bias. I will not, I will not dismiss that, because when you're being biased, sometimes you don't see it yourself, and sometimes you need a friend to say, "Hey, you're being biased." But at the same time, too, I'm not seeing any of this information be presented with these noble researchers, which are swimming upstream in regard to trying to get our attention, but to no avail. Uh, it's not, they're not breaking, uh, hasn't surfaced yet. Let's put it that way. All right, so let's begin. Let's look at the European uh, rebuild. Uh, what we have, VARES is down, uh, not down. VARES, it's been Thanksgiving weekend, so let's just say VARES is delayed. So basically, we'll be looking at the European database because they didn't, uh, they updated theirs. Uh, these are the serious reactions we're looking at so far, but let's just look at the data as a whole. This is what you look at: six hundred and fifty-six thousand one hundred and four serious reactions uh, as of November 27, 2021, all right? And these are the primary ones. Serious reactions in the European database means something that results in hospitalization. And so, yeah, a lot of people are going to the hospital, also have headaches and so on and so forth. But these are the most common reactions on, that result in emergency medical treatment or medical care. Now, total number of reactions. Now, no, let me show you this. Check this out. All right, so look at this number right here, 656,104. Now, we just rebuilt this database. Just got to show people an example on how to pull data from the European database. But this amazed me, 656,104. What was the number of serious reactions last week? This just happened to be serendipity. Last week, 505,026 reactions that required medical care. This week, 656,104. All right, total number of uh, adverse events reported to your vigilance is, was 120, that's all right, 1,207,119. 1,207,119 1,207, reported to your vigilance. All right, and let's preface that at the exact same time. These are serious reactions, require medical care, reported to, endure vigilance. Now let's look at COVID rebuild. 
All right, we just checked out Florida. Let's go to, and again, looking at this real again fast, this is when the pandemic first began. May 2020, mortality was about 2.99 per 100,000. Uh, now we're about 2.21 per 100,000. And we're inoculating, distancing, masking. Yeah, you get the point. I showed you Florida. That's new deaths per 100,000. Uh, they must be competent somewhere numerically. And so if we go back four weeks, look at that drop. If we go back year to date, you see they go up and down. And now Texas began to drop as far as following that algorithm. All right, let's go to the top real fast. Get past all the hospital information. Do, 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 do. Here we go. Going backwards, age mortality breakdown per CDC. Vast majority of individuals that unfortunately succumb to COVID-19 are about 85 or older. And thank goodness our youth. Now again, exposure to common coronavirus we said before does help build resistance so it's going to be a curious event that the kids staying out of school for so long and avoiding all those colds um if the immune system uh i don't want to even think about that if the immune system is going to be adequate for the rest of the years proceed forward uh here we are age average age of mortality right about there and that's just the bar chart just to give you a, a better perspective all right let's move forward to mutations this week, what I'll show you do is how to pull data from either uh, uh, either our world and data, John Hopkins or Oxford or the GIS aid. It references the variants, so you don't get uh, so you have ability to gather information on your own, uh, just because it's helpful. All right, let's just go up to the top real fast. Here we are. I want to stop right here, not to stop the the video, but stop as far as not go to the top here. This we're checking vaccine efficacy from an observational from observation vaccine efficacy. This is fully vaccinated per 100 people. Total cases per million. These are your most vaccinated countries. Compare it to other vaccine tiers: 0 to 10, 11 to 20, all the way up to 81 to 100. And now that Singapore passed 90, we'll start making another vaccine tier. New deaths per million. Uh, those are countries which are barely vaccinated, and Obviously, we got a good spike there, and that's your countries which are heavily vaccinated. Just to give you an idea, reproduction rate. I yeah, you know, just I don't see it. I mean, I, I know they're vaccinated like crazy, but you know, you could have some premise of reproduction rate, whatever you want, but I'm not. I, again, I that's I'm not seeing it. New cases smooth per million. Yeah, I know you're thinking the exact same thing I am. Um, just, oh, look, we actually uh, have to change that access right there because it went above the access. What are we at? 383 uh, cases per million. When vaccinated at 71 to 80 per 100. Um, I don't know. Uh, again, I'd love to be able to say kumbaya and go, 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 and rah, rah, rah. Uh, but this set of inoculations, I'm just I not seeing it. Uh, remember, with flu vaccines and things like that, there was exposure for generations. And then the vaccines came out. So they had some natural foundation. Uh, this, it's a different dynamic. I don't I don't know. I mean, the first time I've ever seen a vaccine developed for something that just came into fruition, just, you know, possibly a year or two ahead of time. Uh, let's see, for example, now we go through here. We'll go through that later on. Uh, ba -ba, cause we're running short on time. I'm going to get down to the, because um, Omicron is a big thing, but I think if you have, do you all remember Mew? Remember Mew? I'm not talking Pokemon. Mew? Mew? Yeah, Mew. And so, here we are. All right, there's Mew. Remember Mew is the big scary one. Gamma was scary for a while, too. And poor Ecuador has got both Gamma, Mew, and, of course, Delta. And this was reporting as of uh, the 26th of November. So, Delta is the pretty much one. And look at Singapore. Singapore, they got ravaged for whatever reason. I don't know. It's all Delta. It's not Omicron. It's Delta. And here's our first uh, first observation in reference to Omicron right there. And Botswana. Botswana's got Omicron. Almost 
4.92% of the sequences are Omicron, uh, are Omicron, Omicron. And I know I keep it that you think in some movie about robots. Uh, um, and, but most everything else is Delta. I mean, there's a few other ones here that got something else, but Omicron, did Omicron exist? You know, Omicron wasn't there before, but neither Delta came into fruition. And so, you know, Lambda, remember Lambda was a major threat. Uh, Mu still out there some aspects that was back in November, uh, the first November, but you could see how it transpired over time, how it was actually a battle, uh, for variants. And then all of a sudden Delta just took, took over everything. And if Omicron comes up, you know, later on, we'll see. But again, is it, I mean, if it, if that's the concern in Africa and Africa with its caseload and mortality rate being so incredibly low, um, yeah, I don't know why New York did what it did so rapidly and, you know, banning flights and things like that. I mean, the, the element is far worse than the United States, Germany, and every place else and is Africa. And Africa has been just ravaged, not by uh, COVID, but by the lockdowns, uh, and, you know, inflicted on Africa have been just brutal. And, uh, you know, if you want to ever research anything in regards to the, uh, the hardship created on Africa by COVID, uh, you know, I don't think they really need, want our protection anymore. If that's considered protection, then no. All right, proceed forward. And I think that, boy, that may be it. Yeah, I think we are done. We covered all the data frames. Let's go back to the research we did, looked at. Da, ba, bam. And I'm sorry it's so negative this time, but that's all that came out was just the stuff that was questioned in the efficacy from imprinting to anti-idiopathic uh, aspects to maternal vaccination, doubts in regards to the studies. It just was just a train load of stuff that just came out. Not a lot of positive stuff, but a lot of, but a lot of stuff that brought up questions. Hang on one second. Hang on. Yeah, and when you consider the nobility of these researchers, especially considering the fact that they're not doing this for money, fame, or fortune. And in fact, often bringing up questions you know, even minor questions in this age of just tremendous scientific persecution uh, is an incredibly a noble feature. Uh, they're not being negative in reference to a vaccine. They're just basically just bringing up a question. Uh, and henceforth, you know, there you can lose your career. So again, you, these researchers are not doing it for any other reason. Uh, but to basically explore what's going on. So they're doing what researchers do. They ask questions. And science is about asking questions. And it uh, doesn't mean you're going to get answers, but at least they're asking questions. And that takes a lot of bravery these days, I guess. So what we looked at, we looked at basically as follows. Trends in immunology, uh, the problem with the SARS-CoV-2 variants in reference to imprinting. Um, we looked at ba -ba -ba. reinfection with SARS-CoV-2 outcome risk factors of vaccine, vaccine efficacy, the Scottish cohort. We looked at two studies here, as I'm going to scroll back to the top. Possible role for anti-idiotype antibodies in SARS-CoV-2 infection and vaccination. And that was the New England Medical Journal. I have to give them credit for that. That was, that was actually profound that it actually got published there. Uh, Antibodies, the same article, just that was the, the detailed article. Antibodies mimicking the virus may explain long haul COVID-19, rare vaccine side effects. Uh, doo -doo -doo. And I apologize, again, I apologize about tonight. It, it seemed a little long and drawn out, but however though, uh, being Thanksgiving weekend, a lot of information uh, as far as the benefits for stuff that can help wasn't really out there per se, outside licorice, henna, marigold, and uh, lupe. But so we'll get back to that in a second. But this one article here, if you, if any article could be a takeaway and a reference to basically uh, on how we need to improve the um, integrity of our, our checks and balances, this one is it. Maternal COVID-19 vaccination, potential impact on fetal and neonatal development. How can a study be underestimated so highly in reference to the calculations and affect so many people. And our news services just are freaking deficient. I know they pretend to be on your side one way or the other, but reality, they it's nothing gets done. And so it's up to people like ourselves, you and I.
proceed forward. Um, again, observational data. Uh, Benge, Beng, Bengi, Central America. Uh, they just let things go. They didn't have any lockdowns or anything like that. They were concerned about the, you know, you know, you know, you know economical, I want to say ecological, and sociological reasons. And um, we looked at it and they were like, there they are, right there. And so what if we followed the exact same route they did? What if? You know, would be, you know, what if? Think about that. If we just avoided all these problems, if that was going to be the outcome as it is, instead of looking at all these countries where the chick, where the, the little chickens were screaming, the sky is falling, and you know, the the observation does not support their mitigation uh, factors, I, and then they keep and they keep on like um, they escalate it. When they don't get the way the first time, or it doesn't work out the first time, what they do is they magnify it, like um, toddlers. All right, so here we are. There's that. And then exposure to harmless coronaviruses boosts SARS-CoV-2 immunity. Um, it's talking about things like colds and things like that, and so on and so forth. Also, the three plant compounds we looked at that may have be able to help mitigate a lot of the negative outcomes in reference to SARS-CoV-2 infection, which would be really, really cool if they researched. And there they are. I'll have the links for you as well. Henna, of all things. I would never think Henna. That's like so cool. And Marigold. And then finally, ba -ba -ba, we look at licorice. Really cool article in reference to the hypothesis on how it may be worthy of research and help to mitigate negative outcomes in reference to SARS-CoV-2 as well. And if we're in a situation where imprinting may be occurring or something like that, or uh, we have to be honest with ourselves and just say, hey, that what we thought uh, was going to be an effective inoculation may not have the impact that we think. And we should look at other mitigating factors as far as basically prophylactics in treating the ailments, reducing severity once someone is infected. Is that worthy enough? Well, I would have been nice if we did that because we've, you and I have covered multitudes of potential beneficial elements uh, and you know treatment uh, modicums that could have yielded tremendous benefit if the time and money was invested in the continuing the research to either animal trials, or human trials per se. Heck, just vitamin D alone. Just what the heck? You know, strong correlations. We see that come up over and over again. Just do one thing of benefit and uh, you know and see exactly where it goes instead of just relying upon you know this, some of the socially more friction oriented uh, methods as far as pandemic lockdown mitigation factors mandatory vaccinations masks and so on and so forth we could acquiesce it made such an incredible incredible breakthrough in numerous other elements as far as either pharmacological research nutraceutical research so on and so forth but it is late and I am now grandstanding and I forgive me. All right. I'll catch you all a little bit later on. Gratitude to the researchers. Seriously. So you have to keep you. I mean, in order to keep these things up, you really have to give a lot of credit to researchers that are willing to ask the questions that need to be asked. They're not, they're not saying anything as far as it's this way or that way, but the bravery and just asking a question in this atmosphere or environment is like, it's like, it's like, you know, it's looking at Galileo during the dark ages trying to tell people that the earth circles the sun, you know, without ending up in a dark prison cell, as so many of us already have already. Not I, but you know exactly, for example, what I'm talking about as far as other elements for those just, just speaking out. But again, I'm Grand Zanin. Catch you all in a bit. Gratitude. Thank you. Look forward to you all once again next week. Ralph signing off. See you then. Bye.